this is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome back to the teachings, the books of the Bible. Now we're going into the teachings of the Gospel of John, and John is known as one of the disciples of Jesus Christ. We're going to be teaching on the first part of the Gospel of John. And as we go into the teaching, to pray that the Spirit of God will help us to understand what the Word of God is saying and may be receptive and believe that God's Word is truth and life. Be blessed and open and receptive to what God is saying to enrich your life. The Gospel of John, Part 1, Chapters 1 to 10. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke are known collectively as the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic meaning seeing together. They share a common viewpoint and similar material. The Gospel of John, on the other hand, is a supplemental Gospel, providing stories and teachings not found in the Synoptics. While the Synoptics focus on Jesus' Galilean ministry, John highlights his Judean ministry. 92% of John is unique to his Gospel. The Gospel of John is the fourth of the four canonical Gospels. The simplest and most profound of the Gospels is the greatest evangelistic tool ever written. It contains a highly schematic account of the ministry of Jesus, with seven signs culminating in the raising of Lazarus, foreshadowing the resurrection of Jesus, and seven I Am discourses culminating in Thomas's proclamation of the risen Jesus as my Lord and my God. The Gospel's concluding verses set out its purpose that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Matthew presents Jesus to Jewish readers as their Messiah King. Mark presents Jesus to Roman readers as the Servant Redeemer. Luke presents Jesus to Greek readers as the Perfect Man. And John presents Jesus to Universal readers as the Son of God. The Gospel of John reached its final form probably around AD 90 to 110, after the three Synoptic Gospels. John contains signs of origins dating back to AD 70 and possibly even earlier. Like the three other Gospels, it's anonymous, although it identifies an unnamed disciple whom Jesus loved as the source of his traditions. John 21.22 references a disciple whom Jesus loved, and John 21.24 says, This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them, and we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things that Jesus did. If all of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. Early Christian tradition, first found in Irenaeus, who lived between 130 AD and 202 AD, identified this disciple with John the Apostle. Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp, who was in turn a disciple of John. Irenaeus also wrote that John lived until the time of the Emperor Trajan, between AD 98 and 117. Tradition outlined that the elderly John was requested by the elders of Asia to write the Gospel when he was at Ephesus to counteract and refute a heresy about the nature, person and deity of Jesus. This Gospel is written in good Greek and displays sophisticated theology, leading many scholars to believe the Gospel is unlikely to have been the work of a simple fisherman, but rather that the core of the Gospel relies on the testimony, perhaps written of the disciple who is testifying, as collected, preserved and rearranged by a later editor. As we noted, most scholars estimate the final form of the text to be around AD 90 to 110. The author does seem to have known some version of Mark and Luke as he shares with them some items of vocabulary and clusters of incidents arranged in the same order. The key terms from those Gospels are absent, or nearly so, implying that if he did know them, he felt free to write independently. The majority of scholars see four sections in the Gospel of John. A prologue, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, an account of the ministry, often called the Book of Signs, from chapter 1, verse 19 to chapter 12, verse 50. The account of Jesus' final night with his disciples and the Passion and Resurrection, sometimes called the Book of Glory, from chapter 13, 1 to chapters 20, 31. And a conclusion and epilogue from chapter 20, verse 30 through to chapter 21, verse 25. The prologue informs readers of the true identity of Jesus, the Word of God through whom the world was created and who took on human form. He came to the Jews and the Jews rejected him, but to all who received him, the circle of Christian believers, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God. The book of signs about the ministry of Jesus. Jesus calls his disciples and begins his earthly ministry. 
He travels from place to place, informing his hearers about God the Father in long discourses, offering eternal life to all who believe, and performing miracles which are signs of the authenticity of his teachings. But this creates tensions with the religious authorities, manifested as early as chapter 5, verses 17 to 18, who decide that Jesus must be eliminated. The Book of Glory tells of Jesus' return to his Heavenly Father. It tells how he prepares his disciples for their coming lives without his physical presence, and his prayer for himself and for them, followed by his betrayal, arrest, trial, crucifixion and post-resurrection appearances. The conclusion sets out the purpose of the Gospel, which is that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This is followed by the epilogue in chapter 21, telling of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances in Galilee, the miraculous catch of fish, the prophecy of the crucifixion of Peter, and the fate of the beloved disciple. The structure is highly schematic. There are seven signs culminating in the raising of Lazarus, foreshadowing the resurrection of Jesus, and seven I am sayings and discourses, culminating in Thomas's proclamation of the risen Jesus as my Lord and my God. The same title, Dominus et Deus, claimed by the Roman Emperor Domitian, who reigned between 81 and 96 AD. Part 1 of the Gospel of John explores chapters 1 to 10, and Part 2 will explore chapters 11 to 21. Whereas Matthew and Luke begin with Jesus' birth and genealogy, John begins with the pre-existing word in chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that had been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made its, its dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John the Baptist is introduced as announcing the coming of the Messiah. When John is pressed by the leaders in Jerusalem, referred to in the Gospel as the Jews, as to who he is, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, and I myself did not know him. But the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The next day Jesus starts to call his disciples. In John chapter 2 Jesus performs his first miracle, although he's prodded into it by his mother Mary. With wine exhausted at a wedding in Cana in Galilee, Jesus instructs the servants to fill water jars with water and then serve the master of the banquet. The master commends the host on serving fine wine at the end of the meal against normal custom. Chapter 2 verse 11 tells us, What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. John continues the chapter by recounting Jesus clearing the temple of the money changers and those selling sacrifices. 
To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remember that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. John chapter 3 is probably the most famous and most read chapter in the Christian Bible. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Verily, truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Verily, truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my sayings. You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believe in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness and instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be saying plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Jesus and the disciples go out into the Judean country baptizing. Some of John's followers go to John complaining, Rabbi, that man who is with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everyone is going to him. To this John replied, A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourself can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. The joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, 
but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see light, for God's wrath remains on them. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So Jesus left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? But Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Why can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so they won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you, you have had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband. What have you just said is quite true. So the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews, yet a time is coming and has come now when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is Spirit and his worshippers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. The disciples returned and are surprised to see Jesus talking to a woman. The woman, however, leaves a water jar and goes to the townspeople. Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Saviour of the world. Jesus then returns to Cana and heals the son of an official at Capernaum, that the Gospel notes is Jesus' second miracle. In chapter 5, we read of the healing at the pool of Bethesda. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate of Paul, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, 
Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, It's a Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, but Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are all well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves his son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to those he pleased to give it. Moreover, the father judges no one but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed from the death of life. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has not come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in, him, in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who were in their graves will hear his voice and come out. And those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you choose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the weary works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice or seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You studied the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me and have life. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from another, but do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. But do not think I can accuse you before the Father. Your accuser 
is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you, did, you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? In chapter 6, Jesus feeds the 5,000, following the Synoptic Gospels, and then walks on water, crossing from the far shore of the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum. The next morning, the crowd, realizing Jesus has crossed the lake, follows him. They asked Jesus when he got to Capernaum, but he replies in chapter 6, verse 26, Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes from heaven and give life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me or never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Of this the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Yours Ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. 
On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching, who can accept it? And while his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh comes for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet, there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I tell you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who though one of the twelve was later to betray him. In chapter 7, Jesus tells his brothers he's not going to the Feast of Tabernacles, but does in fact do so. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, How did this man get such learning without having been taught? Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. The controversy over Jesus' healing on the Sabbath continues, with some saying that Jesus was the Messiah and others denying it. Some try to seize Jesus, but it's not yet his time. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink, and whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his word, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. Still others asked, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Even the temple guards recognized the authority of Jesus' teaching, but the Pharisees and leaders refused to believe in Jesus, even accusing Nicodemus when he said they had to hear Jesus before he could be condemned. At this point in discussing faulty judgment, John tells the adulterous woman in John 7.53 to chapter 8 verse 11, which is not found in the earliest manuscripts, but is still regarded by many as being an authentic story about Jesus. In chapter 8 verse 3 we read, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in an act of adultery. In the law Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now. And leave your life of sin. The law required both parties to the adultery to be stoned, but only the woman is brought forward. Jesus probably writes something in the sand to cause the crowd to reflect on their own sinful nature. Once they are gone, there are no witnesses to the crime, so the woman cannot be convicted. But Jesus chastens her to sin no more. The Pharisees again challenge Jesus in verse 25 of chapter 8. Who are you? they asked. Just what I have been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy, and what I have heard from him 
I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me, and he has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed in him. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we should be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. For if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me, because you have no room for my word. I am telling you that what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you are Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you will do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God, Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We're not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. But Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and a father of lies. Yet, because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can anyone of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God, hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. The Jews ask, are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory remains nothing. My father whom claim as your God is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet fifty years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham? Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, Before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. In chapter 9, Jesus heals a man born blind after the disciples asked him who sinned, that he should be born blind. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent him. Night is coming, and when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. The Pharisees tried to condemn Jesus for healing on the Sabbath or dispute the man was ever blind. The healed man criticized the Pharisees and is thrown out. Jesus heard they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, 
if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. In chapter 10, Jesus identifies himself as the good shepherd. Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listens to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who comes before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatter it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, He's demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you what you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. She do, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listens to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hands. I am the father are one again his jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him but jesus said to them i have shown you many good works from the father for which of these do you stone me we're not stoning you for any good work they replied but for blasphemy because you a mere man claim to be god jesus answered them is it not written in your law i have said you are gods if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, the scripture cannot be set aside. What about the one whom the Father set apart as his own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said I am God's son? Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. Again they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. 
Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, Though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. John's gospel goes through the process of revealing Jesus as the Son of God. He performs miracles, but criticizes those who follow him only to see a miracle. The miracles are to catch our attention, so we then focus on our relationship with the Father. It's the self-righteous who bear Jesus' criticisms, not the sinners who seek repentance. But which category do we fall into? Do we believe we're good and have no worries about our spiritual future? A modern-day Pharisee? Or do we recognize that we need a Savior to put us back in right standing with God? In part two, we will see how this is done, but for the moment we need to decide which category we are in. If you want to repent and join the kingdom of God, then pray this prayer with us. Dear God in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I acknowledge to you that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sins and the life that I've lived. I need your forgiveness. I believe that your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, shed his precious blood on the cross at Calvary and died for my sins, and I am now willing to turn from my sin. You said in the Bible that if we confess the Lord our God and believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead, we shall be saved. Right now I confess Jesus as my Lord. With my heart I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. This very moment I accept Jesus Christ as my own personal Saviour, and according to his word, right now I am saved. Amen? Amen. And so if you've prayed that prayer, then you now enter the kingdom of God. But this is only the beginning. You need to continue in prayer, in reading the Bible, and also find a church that teaches the truths of the Bible and fellowship with um, other believers to strengthen yourself so you can be prepared to face the onslaughts of this daily life and the challenges of the fleshly world that we live in. We just pray that uh, you'll be greatly blessed by now becoming a Christian and fellowshipping with the brothers and sisters in Christ. And yes, God loves us all the same. He's no respect of person. But what's highlighted in the Gospel of John, the first part, is where God is the provider. And he meets us at the point of our need. And as always, he looks at the heart of everyone. But the highlight in, in the first part of John, here we see, and we, we have been reminded of, the woman at the well, and also the woman caught in adultery. But yet in our modern day, we have the tendency of looking at others' fault. And yet, all the time, the fault lies within ourselves. In our daily walk, God's desire that for us not become, for us not to become victims, but become victors in Christ Jesus. And to be all that he created us to be. So our lives are enriched just knowing that the love that he has for us is mean so much more than anyone can, can explain or, or present to us. And where Jesus, he is the truth and the life. And that's just how much God loves us. Allowing Jesus to come on earth so that we are reconciled back to him. And we give God thanks and praise for meeting us at the point of our need, not of our wants. But always remember, you are special, you are a miracle, you're God's gift. And all God wants for you and your life is to demonstrate his glory. So you become effective and you utilize every talent and gift that he's given you. Add value to yourself. It's not receiving or believing what someone else says, believing what God says about you. And as God starts to work in you, he's well able to finish it. And we thank God today. Today is the beginning of greatness and great things he wants to fulfill in you. I want to thank God for every privilege and opportunity that he has given me. He has given you and everyone to hear his word, not only to hear it, but to walk it, to walk and to stand. And what he has said is true and will forever be true. Jesus is truly the light of the world. And we give God thanks, we give him praise, we give him honor and always glory because of who he is and his 
unconditional love for us. And I pray that you are blessed in the teachings of today. And always remember, it's what God says about you, not what someone else says. Because God is greater than anything or anybody. And he has the final word. And we give him our praise. And we thank him for being a provider of our needs and always making a way where there seemed to be no way. Amen. Amen.